Good evening. <laughs> and welcome to the Science Cafe. <laughs> Tonight we have a really interesting uh, presentation on hand. Acid mine drainage from environmental disaster to art. Uh, presenting are Guy Riefler from Civil Engineering and John Sabra from a Professor of Art. Something a little different for tonight, okay? Now, in two weeks, we have another science cafe, and that's going to be Claudia Gonzalez Vallejo from Psychology. She'll be presenting her research on how judgment and decision making in regard to nutrition may change food labeling policies, okay? And then on the 26th, we have a cafe conversation. Um, in journalism and communication, and they'll be presenting on infographics and how journalists use them in reporting. So those are a few of the things in store for us as the, in the coming weeks. Um, but right now, let's see what art and civil engineering have to do with each other. Thank you. Go for it, Guy. All right, I'm not really used to a mic, so it might take some navigating for me to get that right. Does that sound okay over there? Closer? How's that? Is that better? How about that? Oh, I can hear that back now. Yeah, okay. So that's what it's supposed to sound like. All right, um, so I'm Guy Riefler. I'm a professor of environmental engineering. Um, I got my degree in um, environmental engineering focusing on cleaning up pollution. And when I got my degree, my, my specialty was really cleaning up explosives at military bases. And I took a job here, and I got out here, and I was like, well, now what am I going to do? There's no bases around here. So I looked around for pollution, and um, unfortunately, you can find pollution pretty much anywhere if you, if you look for it in this country. So I'm going to talk about one of the biggest pollution problems in the region here and uh, what we're trying to do with it. So I'm going to start a long time ago, 360 million years ago. Um, this is before the dinosaurs. This is in the, what's called the Carboniferous period. This is the age of um, Pangaea, where all of the land mass was a single continent. Um, the climate and temperature was very strange back then. It was, it was perpetually hot and tropical. Um, and where we're standing right now, there were massive swamps with giant trees and all kinds of um, incredible foliage that lasted for about 60 million years. So 60 million years, if you can think about that length of time, all that stuff, all those plants were taking carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere and turning it into wood and leaves and roots, which accumulated and accumulated and accumulated for 60 million years. So what became of all that stuff, do you think? Coal, exactly. That's why we call it the Carboniferous, Carboniferous period. This was a period in time that was very productive on the planet. These plants were taking solar energy and turning it into stuff. And all that stuff got fossilized through pressure and heat and stuff that I don't understand and produced um, tons and tons of coal, which is we were used to be underneath us right now. So um, this, as you know, this is a massive, um, very useful energy source. Um, 60 million years of solar energy all stored in these rocks that are underground. And all we have to do is dig them up and we can harness that energy. Um, so for, I don't know, probably over 100 years now, we've been digging up this coal and burning it. And this is one of the mine maps uh, for one of the mines nearby. And you can see the, uh, the old mining technique. They use uh, room and pillar uh, techniques here. And what you can see is they, they basically tunnel these labyrinth and the labyrinths and catacombs through, catacombs through the ground to pull out as much coal as they can 
without having the ceiling collapse on them. So that's why, that's why they didn't like sweep out all the coal because then it would just collapse and fall on them. They, they made these little rooms so that the columns they leave behind would hold up the roof. So these deposits from 360 million years ago all of a sudden are exposed to air and water. Um, and all kinds of crazy things happen when you do that. Uh, this is another picture showing sort of the extent of mining in our region here. Um, OU is down there. And you can see the gray, the shaded area there is, has all been mined out by underground mines. So as you drive around here, when you're driving through like Wayne National Forest or on Route 33, and you see all these sort of forested hillsides, just imagine that there are holes and catacombs underneath um, most of them as you're driving through. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna get into a little chemistry as these deposits would have, which have been buried and protected from this very oxidizing environment that we live in, these things that have been underground for 360 million years are suddenly all exposed to air and water. And not just coal is there, right? There's lots of different things in plant matter. And one of the things that also accumulated in this deposit was pyrite, which you can see here. So when that reacts with oxygen and water, it goes through a whole series of chemical reactions, producing, um, among other things, uh, sulfuric acid and iron oxyhydroxide. Okay, so this is what comes out of the mine. This is acid mine drainage is what we call it. This is heavily polluted water. Okay, um, doesn't really look so bad, right? Looks like something you might come out of the tap. In fact, I wanted to make sure I didn't mix up uh, what glasses I was drinking out of here. But this is what it looks like coming out of the mine. This is high in sulfuric acid and high in uh, a reduced form of iron called ferrous iron, which is in that first reaction there. And this is what it looks like when it pours out of the mine. And we have lots of mine seeps throughout the region where this is just pouring out 24 hours a day at very large flow rates. As it flows down the stream, it splashes around, gets exposed to oxygen, and as the oxygen reacts with the water, these reactions take place. And what you can see, I hope, let's hope this works, is that iron changes form. So iron is a very interesting metal in that it has multiple oxidation states. It also has multiple minerals that it can form. It's a very, um, it's a very flexible element, I guess you could say. Um, so this is what our streams end, end up looking like when they're polluted with acid mine drainage. Yeah? This, no, this is an oxidant. What I just poured in there is hydrogen peroxide. And um, so in the streams, it's oxygen that works as an oxidant, but this is uh, better for demonstrations. <laughs> Okay, so these are some pictures from the neighborhood, basically. Um, this is the True Town Seep. This is uh, maybe 20 miles from where we're standing. Um, this is a 30 square mile mine complex that in 1982 or something erupted in someone's backyard. A million gallons a day pours out of that every day for the last uh, I don't know, what's that, 24 years, 34 years, and it's still going today, and nobody is cleaning, cleaning it up. Um, this is another stream in a different region, but this picture up here shows you every one of those diamonds is an acid mine drainage seep in Ohio. So you can see where all the mining was done, and that's where all the pollution is. Okay, so, yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, well, uh, so. Oh, thank you. So the question is, where does the water come from that generates all this acid mine drainage? And um, when you're when they're the, when they're working the mine, many of these mines are below the, the groundwater table. And to work the mine and capture the coal, they have to put on pumps to lower the groundwater table, table and keep the water out of the mines. But when they're done, um, before there are regulations on it, they just turned off the pumps and walked away. The mines flooded, and then the water started coming out. Yeah, great question. Um, so this, if you're a fish, this is a big problem, OK? It makes everything you do in life difficult to live. And we find streams that are heavily impacted by acid mine drainage have really poor fish populations. Some of them um, are uh, devoid of native fish that should be there. So these things are devastating to the local ecology. Um, but in some ways, they are natural. Okay, So it's just iron. It's not in itself toxic. And you can find these deposits throughout the world. And for a long time, um, well, since the beginning, we've been using these materials. So this is a cave painting from France. And all of these cave paintings um, use uh, just a few, a few different colors, black, red, orange, yellow. The red, orange, and yellow all comes from these iron oxide deposits. So that got us thinking about, well, we've got pollution. It's too expensive to treat. But you can go out and buy iron oxide pigment, um, and it's sold for a pretty good price. So how about we take this pollution and sell it? I did a little looking around. And the first couple articles I looked at, other people have looked at this and they said, ah, it doesn't work, There's, uh, the chemistry's not right. Uh, but I did a little more searching and uh, I found this color, uh, I don't know how to say it, Fallon Red? Do you know? Sure. <laughs> uh, it's, there's a mine in Switzerland that for the past 400 years has been collecting their acid mine drainage and turning it into paint. And this color is like the national color of Switzerland, if there is, you can think of such a thing. And it's got, you can see it's a gorgeous color. It's this nice bright red. Their mines are a little different. This is a copper mine. It's got, chemistry's different, but it inspired me. Um, the other thing I found out is that the pigments that we use in the United States today, it's an enormous market, uh, 50,000 metric tons per year. That's a lot and a lot of pigment. It's a $50 million market. Um, oh, that's just US production. We import 178,000 metric tons every year, most of it from China. And a lot of it is produced, the majority of it is produced synthetically through this sort of water treatment process. So that also gave me inspiration as to what we can do. So then for about 10 years, I was collecting acid in my drainage, putting it in jars, trying different oxidants and different chemi chemical techniques. And um, we were using tubs from Walmart and bubbling and mixing and measuring pH and, and doing all these tests. And I produced a lot of like really bad paint, a lot of like brown and like baby poop color, you know, just stuff that, and I would send them, and I send a couple to paint companies. They were like, eh, no good. So I had to get a little more sophisticated with the chemistry. And um, the iron chemistry is very interesting. As, a, as an element, it can form a variety of different minerals. I'm only showing three here, but I, there's probably eight or 10 different minerals, maybe even more, that iron can form just using oxygen and hydrogen. And so ferrous iron is what comes out of the mine. That's clear. Um, you then oxidize it to ferric, and then very quickly, depending on conditions, it will precipitate as a, as a mineral. And the problem I was having is I was producing a mixture of all of these things, and that has no value in the marketplace. But if you can direct this precipitation process towards one mineral or another, like hematite or gertite, those have a very, or magnetite, 
Uh, so magnetite's black, hematite's red, gertite is yellow. Those have a lot of value in the marketplace. So I was playing around with this, and um, the color isn't very good here. Uh, but we started to come up with some conditions in the lab that we thought would work. Uh, we started to understand the chemistry a little better, how to control that precipitation process so we can produce a more uh, pure paint. Um, one way to test for mineral content is powdered x-ray diffraction. And that's what this figure shows. So this is like one of my brown sort of nasty things. And the blue, you can see the blue lines are just all over the place. Um, the red line is the, our target mineral. And when I produce it under a different condition, I can get much closer to my target. You can see the blue lines map to the red spikes very well. So I'm producing fairly pure mineral at that, with that. Um, and under different conditions, I could increase the iron content in my, final con in my final product. And we got to the point in the lab where now we could produce um, high quality pigment, at least what I think is high quality pigment. It's, it won't really be high quality pigment until I can get someone to buy it. <laughs> but it looks good at least. Um, so where we are in the process right now is, is we've we understand the basic science. We understand the factors involved to make good pigment. Um, and we're, right now, we're seeking money to build a plant to do this full scale. Well, to do this pilot scale. So the idea is you go to one of these sites, like that mine that's pouring out of someone's backyard, and you build a water treatment plant right there. And as the water comes out of the mine, it goes into your plant. And through a series of processes of aeration and settling and then um, filtration and uh, neutralization, you can take the iron out of the water, collect it in a sludge, process the sludge so you end up with a nice uh, powder which you can then sell. The other stream is the water which you're taking the iron out of. After the iron's removed, you then neutralize the pH. That goes back to the stream, or that goes into the stream, and where it will no longer harm fish. Yes? Uh, say it one more time. Uh, how much of the iron has to be removed for the water to be safe? So yeah, I want to be clear about this again. Iron is really not toxic to people. Um, but it is harmful to fish. And I don't know, the standard we use is one milligram per liter. Uh, the mine that I'm working on here, the source water is 340 milligrams per liter. So there's a lot to take out. Um, yeah. That's. Uh, that's the overall objective. That's what I'd like to do. I'd like to build these plants to treat the whole, all of the water. But we're not there yet. Right now I'm seeking money for a smaller plant, really a demonstration plant, something that'll work 24-7 and treat just a portion of the water. Yeah. Uh, byproduct, byproducts from the process. No, not really. Um, so we, ha we go through a fair amount of chemical to neutralize the water. We need a lot of base, and to buy that is fairly expensive. Um, but no, so I'm sorry, the question was what, uh, what harmful byproducts are from this process, and there, there really aren't any. So the question is, um, what's the work to output ratio? How much work do we have to do to get a certain amount of pigment? And um, so uh, I'm going to answer your question, but this is going to take a second. Um, 
in uh, getting funding for this. As I said, I started this about 10 years ago. Um, it's been difficult to get funding for this uh, through the normal channels because this is not really basic research. It's kind of applied. Um, so I've pieced together res uh, research a variety, of, a variety of ways. One of them is I teach uh, environmental senior design class. So I've had the students in this class uh, design this process um, in various years. And this is one group out collecting samples on a very cold day. And um, this is the plant that one of um, my design teams designed. And uh, they estimated to treat that True Town seep, which I've talked about, which pumps out a million gallons per day, it would cost 3.4 million to build. And then to operate it would cost $725,000 a year. So that's, most of that goes towards neutralizing the acid, which will protect fish. Um, it also covers uh, operating the cost and personnel to run the plant. Um, but we could make or we could sell um, over a million dollars a year in um, pigment. So we should be able to treat the water, uh, run the plant, sell pigment, and make money all at the same time. Yeah, that's a great question. So the question was, uh, since it's so expensive to neutralize the acid, maybe there's a more natural way or a cheaper way to do that. And yeah, we, we are looking at that actually. And, and I don't know, uh, so this plant, that, this demonstration plant, we're looking at using a slag bed. Um, slag is a waste product from the steel manufacturing industry, so it's very cheap. It's, a, it's their hazardous waste. And it's hazardous because it's really high in pH. It's really basic. So we can take their basic high pH waste, mix it with our acid low pH waste, and neutralize both of them. So, but there's, there's problems with it too. But. Yeah, so the question is, um, would this only work at one site or multiple sites? And um, yeah, we would have to build a little water treatment plant at each site, simply because it's too expensive to truck the water around and they're too far apart from one another in most cases. Um, if this did ever get it, or when this gets off the ground, I should say, <laughs> um, uh, we could have a centralized plant for like the pigment processing, for the sludge processing. So there would be separate little plants at each of the uh, acid mine drainage seeps that treat the water, and then the sludge that gets collected all gets brought to one spot for processing. Yeah, that's a great question. So the, the question was how different are the uh, acid mine drainage seeps from site to site? Um, and that is a big, uh, I wouldn't say problem, but that, that does limit this process. The mines that I'm targeting around here, uh, their chemistry is very high in iron and has, is very low in other metals. So this really only works in geologic regions where that's the case. Um, that's fairly common around here, but there are some mines around here that are high enough in aluminum. They have a, a fairly high aluminum content that this process would not work there, at least as I've got it right now. Um, there's other mines out west that are in a similar situation that where the runoff is, is a mixture of metals and not pure iron. Um, I have done a little work looking at separating the metals, and I, I think that's possible, but um, I want to do the easy stuff first. <laughs> yeah. 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 
Yeah, so what's the range of pH at these sites? Um, it's horrendous what, <laughs> what we find out in the streams. Um, and actually, I should say, it's, it's gotten a lot better. Um, the watershed groups in Ohio Department of Natural Resources has done a lot of work uh, cleaning up the streams in the region. Um, the ones that I'm talking about are the ones that are really high flow rate and really acidic, and there's just no good technology for them right now. But uh, those sites, um, once the mine drainage gets completely oxidized, the water itself can be negative pH. You won't find that in the stream. And when you measure it coming out of the mine, um, you'll see pHs between 2, 4, 5, something like that. Um, but that, that's because the chemistry hasn't um, fully uh, reached equilibrium yet. Um, but, you know, anything below 7 can be dangerous to high quality fish. So, um, yeah, it's bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, you have to deal with in your settling tank, are there sulfate minerals that drop out at all when you raise the pH of it? Or is that like because of the combination, you don't really have to worry about it? Uh, we, no, we don't get much sulfate accumulation. We, we actually tested that and we ex were expecting that, but we don't. Um, for whatever reason, the sulfate solids do not form. We did find that if we uh, triple or quadruple the sulfate concentrations, we do start to see sulfate in our, or sulfur in our um, pigment. But uh, no, it's not an issue. I don't know why. All right. Um, so that is the science and engineering side of this. Uh, as I said, um, research-wise, there's a few other things I'm working on to optimize the process to, to make things faster and better. Um, but I'm really at the stage now where I want to start building something and um, cleaning up streams. Um, so I'm at a crossroads, and, and I think there's a lot of good work here. But uh, it wasn't really until I got an artist involved that things started to change. Um, that's when this project really started to get traction. And uh, I would like to introduce my colleague, John Sabra, who's been a big help on this. Thanks, Guy. Good job. Hi. Ooh, good job. You turned that right on. That was, that was quick. Um, I'm John Sabra. I'm a professor of art in the School of Art plus design here, and I chair the painting and drawing program here as well. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what Guy asked me to do uh, to come in for the project and how that evolved from there. Talk a little bit about uh, where my art derives from and how that relates to these pigments and things. And then I brought a bunch of supplies, and anybody that wants to make a painting, we can make a painting in like two seconds, and you'll look like a genius. So it'll be great. Okay. Genius might be a little... Uh, genius. Okay, so... Um, yeah, so guy comes to me and he's like, you know, I have this stuff. Or actually, you know, this is, so Athens is, you know, a lot of you are maybe Athenians yourselves, so you know how things happen here. So, like, um, this person who's a kid played soccer with my kid. We're at the rec league together and, and the kids are out there, you know, playing in the mud. And she just turns to me and says, well, I got a friend of mine and uh, he's working on this thing and he needs somebody who can do, like, artist pigment stuff. And I was like, yeah, sure, that's good. So um, that's when we had coffee. I think it was at Wits. I can't even remember, but maybe it was uptown um, back in 1937. <laughs> and, um, and he's like, well, we've got these pigments. Just like he described to you, they're kind of brown. We need pigments, but they need to be like high quality. Otherwise, the whole idea of this selling and being profitable is just not going to work. And I was like, and I don't know. So as an artist, my head kind of, you know, I hear one thing, and then my mind turns into like a million things before I turn around and do something else. So I was like, no, here's what has to happen, you know. Art has to be huge and sexy and awesome, and then people will see it and they'll like what we do. Uh, uh, you know, like, got excited about it. Um, <laughs> so you can attest to. So it was really fun to see those different colors that came out of it, and uh, I've been an environmental activist my entire career. So it was a natural sort of uh, mix for me to get involved in that. And once we started processing it, we got through this, we got through the pigments, we got them finer, we got them uh, more specific, we got the colors so they're luxurious, because I paint in oils and acrylics all the time. So for me, the touch of a pigment, how it sits on a canvas, how it sits on a brush, how it cleans up, how it blends with other colors, what kind of luminosity it has, in other words, when light refracts through it, 
Does it feel like it's a live paint or does it feel like it's a dead, dull paint? All of those qualities were the things that I brought to bear in dealing with uh, the things that Guy produced from the lab. And so in playing with those things, we ended up with a pigment that we really liked. Fortunately, when I was probably most of your age and I was um, doing a job for minimum wage in an art supply store, um, I met one of the uh, American manufacturers of paints, uh, Robert Gamblin, who has a company called Gamblin Artist Colors. So I contacted them by um, actually, um, so I, I just walked in uh, to their factory <laughs> in Portland. I was on a trip and I was like, hey, it's, I'm in Portland. Oh, man. So I walked in and the receptionist is like, no one can see you today. And I was like, oh no, but seriously, it really, it really, it's a cool idea. It's really cool, I swear. <laughs> so she was like, okay, Scott, one of our managers can come out. We can only see you for two minutes. And I was like, okay, that's cool. So Scott comes out and stuff. Shake hands, do things you're supposed to do. And, um, and we spent three hours together uh, touring the factory and talking about the project, which was great. So we produced this uh, first batch of paints and distributed them in New York uh, when I was invited to give uh, several talks there. And then just recently, um, they've agreed to actually work with us and produce our pigment um, in a limited edition this fall of uh, 500, possibly 1,000 tubes. And it'll be labeled with um, our names, which is very cool, Reefless the Bra, and, um, and Gamblin as well. Um, they also have another project that I can't talk about in detail, but we may be working towards much more sustainable pigments over the long run for the entire industry around the world. Um, and because they've seen through our process that you can source these pigments. So it's very, very cool, very exciting, um, which is like, yay. So big achievement. Um, at this point, we have a company that wants our stuff, so we know it's, it's good enough pigment finally, so the high quality is there and everything, which is fantastic. Um, so how we got Gamblin and other people interested on in a broad term, we just had CNN here filming us, which was really a trip. Um, good guys though, um, out at the site. So they, we always make Guy put on the waders and get him in the stream, so he gets all covered in orange and stuff. Occasionally we made John go out there, and Mr. Timmons over there. Um, we, grad students are, you know, they can get dirty. Because um, of all, our wait, all of our waders leak, if I'm correct. I think all of them leak. We just don't tell people until they're in them and in the stream. Um, you know, full experience. So um, what interests me in this project, I think what made me jump onto it right away, was the way I work as an artist. And like, have any of you gone to the library and you wanted that one book that was there and it's not on the shelf and you talk to the library and it's just not there and they're like, well, it's checked out, it's been checked out for six months and the person hasn't returned it? I'm that guy. And I'm sorry about that. I know, it's very angry at me, I can tell. So. Um, <laughs> What I did one time is I took all these books where I had like stacked in the studio, like, you know, stacks of books and they have all these little pieces of paper in there. And they're all science books. Like, I don't, my, my, my students are here, but, oh, shoot, Jesus is here. I'm gonna, I don't really read a lot of art books. I read a lot of science books because <laughs> I like the stuff. So this is a collection of 1,600 images that I pulled from that, those books that I had to return so I could actually, you know, go get more books so they wouldn't be mad at me. Um, and this is what my mind is like every day all the time, walking here, listening to people say things, looking at that kid in his hat over there with a the pattern on top and the fur and stuff, and I'm thinking about if I could do a thing with a thing, and it, you know, so seriously. Um, like, this is what happens. So I'm, I get these books. Ooh, okay, it's bad in here. But anyway, I get these books, and can we kill those lights for a minute or no? Is this bad TV to kill the lights? Okay, never mind. Never mind. Okay. So <laughs> this is the Ring Nebula. It's like millions of light years across. Um, it's in outer space, just FYI. And... So I love this picture. I'm like, no, it's too perfect. It's like, oh, you know, Oculus, I think, you know, mini video games made from this. And then I see this um, overhead image of the uh, mineral pools at Yellowstone, which is like about a quarter mile across, you know? And then I look at this diatom, which is like, you know, you can't see it. It's very small. And, and I'm like, and I'm sitting there and I lay at night and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is what happens to me all the time. And then um, I make a painting out of it. So this is actually terrible, but nonetheless, this is a close-up of one of the paintings that I started making about the time I met Guy, and I started working with these pigments from the environment. Um, and so this is one of the paintings. It's on aluminum panel. It's about, it's this big. And um, once I started this series, what would happen, this is strange, because my first abstract paintings I made, and my dealer in Chicago was really mad, because he thought he was getting little landscape paintings that I was making at the time, and so I showed up with a bunch of abstract things on aluminum panel, and, and he was like, wow. Um, we sold them all, which is great, though. And so what happens is people in the show, they come in and they look at a piece, and for them, this means something. This connects them to something in their past that has to do with nature, do with an experience that emotionally and psychologically ties them to nature. It means something important to them. And so they come to me and they turn, I can see them, they'll just be at the end, they'll walk over and they'll just turn around and look at me 
like from across the gallery. And I'm like, oh, here they come. And they'll come like running across. And they're like, you know, I remember this one time where I saw these things. They're about mining and a thing. And your painting are reminding me of, oh, you know, and that's what I want. I want somebody to bring their experience and their understanding of nature, what they value in nature to me. I don't want to tell them exactly what they should value. So here's a painting of mine as well. So somebody else turns to me and goes, saw this Nautilus shell and this jet engine thing that was really cool and a thing that happened here and I really want to work for the environment and say things, you know? And for me, I'm like, yes. So then we have conversations. Then when you talk about conservation or supporting projects like ours, then you have someone who understands the value of it from a personal, emotional, psychological standpoint. So that's why I make the work I make. And that's why I make the work I make with these pigments doing this. But in doing it, it changes you. Whenever you collaborate with people and you learn what they're doing, it changes who you are and what you do. So this is a map of uh, the Southern Ohio area. This is the Hawking down here. And these are the, the watersheds here, the Monday Creek and the Sunday Creek. And all these little dots are places where there's acid drainage and places where we work. And one of my students asked me, like, well, what, what does it matter? Like, by the time this gets to the Gulf of Mexico, it doesn't matter. It's like, it's all diluted. It's just a little bit. And I thought about that. And they're right in a way, right? I mean, this is like, you know, here's the Hawking River, right? So here's this river system, and those are the, where those watersheds drain into. And then you look at the Ohio River Basin and how that comes together. And then you look at this, which is actually the, you know, the feeder into the top half of the Mississippi River. But then you think about all the 7,000 tributaries that feed into the Mississippi River and exit the Gulf of Mexico, which then gets taken around the world. You know what I'm saying? And so I'm thinking, yeah, maybe, you know, it doesn't seem like it makes much difference that we make, you know particles per billion difference or per million difference up here. But I don't think we can afford to think like that. I don't think we can afford to think it's not going to be that much damage. What's up, Crow? Hey, man, good to see you. Speaking of soccer, rec soccer. You know? But in the same, what if instead of that one negative particle per billion that exits and goes into the world streams, what if we make it into one positive particle? What if we restore all these watersheds up here into a place where it's really alive and it's fully working? and everything is living there, what positivity does that do to the world and what does that change the world? How does that change the world? And it seems small, but I think it's big. So these kind of connections, thinking about how all, how all of this positivity rather comes together to make something bigger than itself. I'm thinking about my students. This was, it's dark, okay, pretend it looks good. Um, so um, you know where Dunham's is over out in the mall out there? Um, that used to be, okay, thank you. That used to be a Kmart and it went defunct. And uh, so the guy who owns the mall donated the Kmart space to me to do a, a project in like 2006 and 7. And so these are my students that worked on a project for like half a year in that dead Kmart space, um, which was called Scale. And this is a drawing of the Milky Way galaxy that we made by hand with charcoal and erasers. Um, it's 10 and a half feet tall and it's 85 feet long. Um, and it was, yeah, it was that, exactly. Um, although, to be honest, we just take drills and put erasers in the drills and we made stars that way through the charcoal. It was pretty cool. Um, I know I invented that, just me. Um, so it was pretty cool. So these same group of students, you know, we, the, the idea of scale was to talk about, in terms of um, astrophysics, to talk about the true scale of humans and the true connectivity that we all really share on this planet, how really special that is. And I continued that idea through working with students here. The first installation in the new finished Baker Center was right out here, and that was my students doing a sustainability sprout thing that had all these leaves on it that people made pledges of what they were going to do to live more sustainably, which was great. It was a student's idea. It was a class I had called Save the World. And even just recently, we do all these projects. If you've gotten any bread at, at Doug and Francesca's fantastic bakery on East State, um, that mural on the side of it, this was a crew that I did, that I put together last year, Arts and Entrepreneurship, and all the brown and all the faux Tuscan things are all made with the acid mine drainage paint that we're making here today, because we could shift those colors, which is fantastic. Um, so a guy showed me his uh, student's version of the plant that they came up with, and I thought it'd be really great to see what art students would come up with. So last spring, I created a class called um, Art and Science, and we had a bunch of art students and some other students in it, and we took them out to the watershed. This is Michelle Shively, one of our amazing contributors, um, works the watershed coordinator out there, and we all looked at these tanks. There's a guy in the wintertime. He grows a beard in the winter. It's like a winter thing. I'm like a year-round squirrel kind of thing. And so we told them about the plant, we told them what the restrictions were, and they came up with, um, with these ideas for the plant and what it would look like. You guys can't see, can you? So, I mean, you know, guys is a really important in terms of figuring out how things flow, but at the same time, if you're a town and you have a public park and we're going to plunk a pilot plant in your public park and we're going to go, there it is, Merry Christmas, you know? 
it should look cool. So the townspeople feel like, yeah, we got a plant. Have you seen our plant? You should see our plant. Instead of like, yeah, those guys from OU came and ruined our village. So, you know, um, even though maybe you don't like Buckminster Fuller meets, you know, Martha Stewart, um, you know, or like Teletubbies or unicorn poop, you know, um, whatever it is, it doesn't matter. The whole point is to get people thinking about how creative we could be and how this would benefit the community that's there. Not just in terms of what we're doing in terms of cleaning up the streams, but how are the people there going to love their community and fall in love with the idea of environmental activism, of sustainability processes. And this fits in with something I've been fascinated with, and I switched to a new body of work, and I have a painting I'll show you here. Just don't lick it. Um, there's this, so for those of you taking notes for class, this is a pseudoscience. Make sure you quote me on that, okay? It's a pseudoscience. But it's called construct all law, which is this interesting idea that everything in the universe, whether it's animate or inanimate, in order to continue to exist, it has to create an efficient system of getting things in and getting things out. So the uh, pseudoscience examples are um, nighttime shots of cityscapes that look exactly, at least formally, like neurons from the human brain, you know? Or how all these things have the exact same shape but different, you know? Nautilus shells, fiddlehead ferns, hurricanes, galaxies, that kind of thing. Giant satellite images of river deltas and maps of the human lung. All these things. So I start thinking about this stuff, and I think in terms of philosophy. I think of tying all these hermetic cults together, you know? which I'm fascinated with because I don't have to be a guide. I don't have to go. I don't have to answer questions like, what's the soul fight rate? I'm like, I don't know. I like their first album, but after that, you know? Um, so I'm still the artist guy, and I'm like, these guys are crazy. They were thinking the universe was a tree, and stuff on the tree made sense with the other tree. And I was like, yes, it means something, you know? And then I think about all these things we use today. Like, look at the, ev we, right? In class, I don't know if anybody here's from, like, had anybody in class go, like, you know, evolutionary tree? Look at evolutionary tree, right? And then I see all these other images, which is actually, this is, a, this is a satellite image of the Colorado River when it used to reach the Bay of California before we dried it up. And so I made a bunch of, of paintings um, where I went to botanical gardens and I looked at these connections, looked at these systems, and tried to relate them and find them. Um, these are kind of crap, but, you know, I made better ones. Um, and then looking up at night, and there's actually a little, right here, this is a telephone pole with wires that connect everything, and looking up at streets at night and going, yes, it all connected somehow. And then I made a painting, actually, about that Colorado River image. And so I was thinking about that, and I was thinking about all these connections and all these river formations. And accidentally, when I was mixing paint for Guy's project, the glass molar that I used to make the oil paint on it, when I lifted it up, there was a pattern just like this on the bottom of it. And so I started making paintings with that pattern. And you can't really see it here, so I'm going to skip a little bit. But all of these patterns aren't made by hand. They're made by actually the same process that we mix these paints with, which is crazy, like this one here. You can't see it very much, but I'm going to bring this up. So this is the painting itself. So you can kind of see, like, OK, you can pass it around. Just don't, like, oh, hello, how are you? Just see again. Yes, thank you. So um, this has, like, this, actually, I'm do this. Like, all this texture on here is made by actually just pushing two plates of paint together. You just smash them together, and the fluidity and the makeup of the paints that we have actually creates that pattern. And then I turn it into something that I'm inspired by when I see it. So um, who wants to make a painting? Come on up. Let's make a painting. Don't be afraid. Oh, also, if you guys want like a quick card that talks about our process and stuff, you can take one. It's cool. I feel like I feel like one of those guys selling stuff on the internet, you know? I would hope so. Yeah. Oh, you know what? Okay. Okay. All right, are there uh, more questions out there? Okay, so grab that roll of plastic. Throw it up over here on this far end. Yeah, come on around. You. Um, let's see. Let's try this. Yeah, go ahead. Peel off. There's a thing on it. Peel that surface off. Thanks. Okay, let's, let's open it out and cover the whole table. Okay. Yeah, good. Okay, peel another one. You could have her peel one. She has nothing to do with it. And then, let's see. You, in that bucket, take that piece of um, plastic or the paper off there, and there's a couple brushes in there. Grab me those brushes. It's going to be fun. Okay. You ready? 
Okay, good. You peel it? Okay, sweet. Yeah, but you only need one sign. Okay. So uh, there was a question on if I've done an environmental impact study on what building the, the impact building a plant would have on okay. the, uh, so. the site. And I guess the answer is no. <laughs> I haven't. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the watershed groups have been keeping close track of the impact the so acid mine drainage seep has on the stream. And um, the sites that I'm targeting, uh, there is a, a, a really, um, there is a, a very clear, devastating impact of the acid mine drainage on the streams at those sites. Um, have had a graduate student look at the sustainability of our process and uh, I can't remember all the details of the results but it was very favorable compared with other treatment processes okay. so that's all I got. You guys get together. Grab one side, grab one side, peel it off towards each other, it's going to be hard enough. Hold on. And just pull it towards each yeah. other and hold on to your own plate. Ready? So now that's your extra credit, right? You're like, look at me. Yeah? You guys down? Yeah. Okay. So grab some of those sheets and we can try the glass. Too. Yeah. I don't know what's going to happen with these. That's a great question. So the question was um, I got these the other day. Uh, the question was uh, is the acid mine drainage going to last forever? Is yeah. that, are these coal mines now a new geologic feature that we can depend on? And the answer is no. They will, all of that acid mine drainage will flush out over time. It's just a question of how long. And there are some, some of the older mine pools or uh, mine complexes in Pennsylvania, for example, used to be acid and they no longer are. And some of them are actually good water sources at, at this point, like drinking water sources. Um, Make sure you push it really thoroughly. So it depends on the size of the mine complex, how much water is moving through it, and the local chemistry. So it's, it's complicated. Uh, there have been some geologists at OU, as part of their master's uh, program, have looked at that issue. And uh, I read a thesis, the, the site that I'm looking at that I talked most about today, that student predicted um, the true town was going to run for about another 200 years um, and, and still be acidic and high in iron. So we just have to wait two more centuries. <laughs> Yeah. I don't think your question is like the fish at the target and like this community can't even really fish here. Okay, okay, wait, don't, don't do it. Okay, don't put any more. <laughs> yeah. This is going to squish. Okay, so now you got to put it on there and squish it. Squish it. And then you want to, both you guys want to like. Push, yeah. Like, so so the question was that that, um, that we should push the fish aspect to this for um, and then push with your more. Because a lot of the fish in the area are toxic and are um, are not healthy to eat, and and yeah, that that's totally true. Like, if you look at the EPA recommendation recommendations for the Hocking River, you shouldn't eat a fish out of the Hocking River more than once a month is their recommendation. Otherwise, you're at risk of um, accumulating mercury and PCBs, I believe, in your body at unhealthy concentrations. Unfortunately, our process is not going to help yep. that. What, what we'll do, what this process can do is um, this part? Don't, don't touch restore part. the normal fish populations, bring back um, okay. so yeah, sports ahead. fish yeah. and improve the, the recreation and the, uh, the travel industry basically, the uh, what do you call it, the tourism industry. Really? Yeah. But cool. we have a yeah, lot more to do to get the mercury out. and the PCBs out of the water. I mean, we're probably not making good art, but it's fun art. Yeah, so where does the filtered water go? <laughs> the filtered water goes back in the stream, <laughs> goes to the stream. Yeah. Yeah. Slippery, push hard. Yeah. Racking the table, slippery, straight down, not to the side. Cause... What kind of inputs? I don't, I, don't know, I, don't feel, I don't feel like you're putting into it. So, I don't understand. Say that again. Push, push, do more. All the way around. Really get on your clothes. What do you want? Aluminum or clear? Oh. So um, the question is what kind of input are we going to get on um, 
the design of the plant. And um, I like the way it came the first time. Yeah. So uh, we've done a number of different things. So you know, I've designed it from a technical standpoint. What we need. What, what the physical plant I'll looks like, there's a lot of flexibility okay, in that. Um, John had his students come up with some creative <laughs> ideas on what, would, what it would look like. Yes. Um, we've picked a site where we want to try this in a town called Corning, <laughs> and we've met with the city council and like there, and they are very interested in us building a facility in their park. Okay, cool. um, this is dirty here, so it's that's as far as we've gotten. Yeah. You know, so in, in the proposal that we have to build that, uh, we are going to have community involvement in, in both the design and the actual building of the plant. Um, but at this point, it's just a framework. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Make sure you push it like really, really tight. A little bit at first, go easy at first. Yeah, not super easy, but just a little easy because they'll slide on each other, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, it's, well, it's not about length, it's about pressure. So pressurize it like heavily, don't worry. We don't own the table, so it'll be okay. So the, um, the question was compared to other technologies, how advanced is this technology? Um, Advanced. Uh, so this would be state of the art for acid mine drainage cleanup. But from a technology standpoint, it's it's not um, it's not that complicated. I guess is, is the way to say it. It's fairly simple chemistry. Um, uh, but nobody is doing this right now, and nobody's even really trying. Um, and if, if we can pull this off, um, it would turn something that is a problem into something that is a resource, you know. We could actually make money rather than spending money to clean up these sites. Yeah, I'm heading up there soon. Yeah, we have a lot of our old grad students from years ago teaching yeah, it's pretty limited. It it really um, the proper uh, you know the properties of iron is just limited. But I mean, it is still I don't know. It yellow, orange, red, brown, and black is what you got, and that's I don't know. That's that's a pretty good range, I think. Um, the aluminum I talked about taking aluminum out. Uh, uh, I've looked at that, and we could also feed the aluminum right into the aluminum manufacturing process um, so that's another option it has nothing to do with pigment but it's a way we could sell another product from this yeah. sorry okay now it's gonna be messy it's gonna get all over you feel me okay yeah so um, the question was uh, have we found out other other uses for the pigment and um, that pigment market that I cited, uh, I don't know, 180,000 metric tons a year, um, that includes, so that's for iron oxide pigments, and paint is really just a portion of that. Uh, that market is used for all kinds of construction industry products like brick and concrete and block, um, different laminates. Um, I'm not sure about makeup. It does, there are, there certainly are pigments in makeup, but I think there's different standards for them. I don't know. Okay, but you're the artist. Yeah, um, I'm trying to feed into this sort of commodity industry of pigment, and then it, it gets used for all kinds of things. Right on there, probably keep your bigger chunks to the middle and just a little tiny pattern on the outside. Okay. Don't be afraid there. Come on out. A little bit, a little bit of chicken there. Let's do it. There. A little more. Let's do a little bit more down here. Okay. Yeah. So the, the first question was, oh, yeah, um, I like that. I like that. if good. you raise the pH, uh, does it precipitate out faster? 
And the answer to that is, is yeah, the chemistry on that is very clear that the, the kinetics, the rate of iron oxidation and precipitation is uh, exponentially impacted by pH. So at low pH, it's very slow. At high pH, it's very fast. And it's an exponential function. So if you're at pH 6 and you raise it to pH 8, <clears throat> it'll precipitate out 100 times faster. Um, Do you pull that way? You pull this way. What was the other question? <laughs> I got you. I see those nails. Yeah, so the, the current, um, I talked about the uh, watershed groups and the Ohio Department of Natural Resources, and they, they've done a great job cleaning up a lot of the streams around here. Um, they're one of, one of their uh, probably most successful remediation processes is using lime dosers. So they put in put a big um a giant tank full of lime a, a base and they deliver base to the stream to neutralize the acid and i've really focused on the iron but the acid is really what is most destructive to the fish and the biological life in the stream the low ph is really what kills things um so just by neutralizing the acid they can have a really positive impact on the wildlife in the stream but when you do that, the iron precipitates out, and it does just end up in the stream because it's too expensive to collect and move out. And when they initiate these technologies of a lime doser, they talk about a sacrifice zone. So they put a doser in, it neutralizes the water, iron precipitates out, and they plan in their process that that first mile of stream down from the doser is going to be dead because of the iron precipitating out and the lime accumulating. Yeah, but the rest of the stream benefits greatly, you know. So that that's one of the real advantages of this process is it would it would uh, remove that sacrifice zone. Yeah. Yes. I don't know. <laughs> so the question is, how do we market this paint so people know what they're getting? Um, that's John's, uh, John's job. What, what, what? <laughs> so how do we market this paint so people know what they're getting? Oh, yeah. Um, so that's, dude, you're really good back there. So um, hold on a second. <laughs> yeah. Oh, look at that. It's like invisible. So look at that under a microscope now because science stuff. So basically, um, in terms of the artist manufacturers, the, the idea right now is that a lot of them want to make sure that their products, as much as possible, are American sourced and American made. And uh, artists, uh, ever since the 60s and 70s have become, uh, 1960s and 70s, rather, have become much more interested in making sure that they're seen as being a very positive force um, for the world. So. It's to their advantage, to the manufacturer's advantage, to have these things um, described as sustainable or environmentally friendly or sourced from you know, sustainable sources and that kind of thing. In terms of major manufacturing companies, probably what we're talking about is um, giving the politicians a chance to brag about the cool stuff they did for their state. Um, you know, and making sure that people that use it know that this came from this source and um, it can make everybody look good in the process. So, and, and based on uh, what we've calculated, we should be able to compete in the marketplace um, as is, without any story. So, you know, with that added story, and if a paint company is interested in marketing this product specifically, um, that should give us a real advantage. We got one more, and then we'll call it. Okay. Perfect. So the question is, um, are we in the process of patenting this, and um, how do we credit the students who've worked on it? Um, the first question's easy. Uh, yeah, we just, we're in the process of getting a provisional patent right now. 
on the process. Um, and past students, how do we credit them? Um, With love. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, By showing them in slideshows. So through, the, through the patent <laughs> process, there isn't really a way to do that. Um, Here, wait a minute. Let's just wait a minute. I got an idea. I, I guess, but um, you know, even myself personally, I, my name gets on the patent, but it's OU's patent. It's not my patent. Um, so. What's the chance of job creation? Um, so this will be the last question. Um, so at each plant, we would need an operator. Um, <laughs> So that's, you know, a person per site. Um, there's building the site, so all the construction involved with that. And then um, we're talking about a really high volume of pigment. So at the True Town site, we could produce, I think the number is 4,000 pounds of iron a day. So think about that. Like today, 4,000 pounds of iron was dumped into Sunday yeah. Creek. That's like, that's like junking two cars in that creek every day for the last 34 years, right? And all of that water goes into the Hocking River and flows right past us on campus. Um, so, so we're talking, you know, tractor trailers leaving that facility to take it to a pigment plant twice a week. So there's that too. Okay, I think that's all we have time for. Okay. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Um, just so you know, remember, two weeks, we have a, another science cafe. It'll be on psychology. And then in three weeks, there is a cafe conversation on from journalism. Um, I'm sure that John and Guy would be happy to answer any questions, or inter you guys can come up and talk to them. And of course, you can still make things. See you guys next time. Bye.